Hey, everybody, and welcome back to Legendary Language Learner. I'm here with Mikhail from the channel Your First Second Language. And Mikhail and I, we uh, found each other through a mutual interest in each other's language learning channels on YouTube. And he was kind enough to have me on his channel where we chatted a lot about games and apps and that kind of thing. That's sort of my specialty. And it's the reason why I'm really excited to have him onto my channel today, because I think he can provide us much more valuable information around sort of language learning theories and practices besides games. So I'm really hoping that he can help us to sort of flesh out our understanding. He's always very insightful and very incisive with his recommendations. So before we jump in here to the other questions, I always like to ask people if you could introduce yourself and tell us what languages you have learned and what languages you are learning. So as uh, well, you introduced me uh, very well, uh, rather rather generously actually, but uh, but my name's uh, Mikhail Sheikh. I'm an English language learner. And um, as, uh, as, as you said, I have a channel called uh, Mikhail Sheikh, your first, your first second language, because I think acquiring an additional language apart from your native one is invariably the invariably the biggest challenge and from that point learning further languages becomes be, becomes more possible mm -hmm. so at the moment i'm learning spanish with some uh, urdu which is more or less the same language as the hindi language but it has a different script and uh, arabic as well i have dabbled in a few other languages so i've a while ago i was somewhat conversational in Italian, somewhat conversational in French, and well, I wouldn't even say conversational in Greek, but could hold could hold the most basic conversation. So I have I have dabbled in a few languages. The only language at this point I would say that I have some some level of fluency with that that would be Spanish. There are there are uh, clearly clearly uh, many holes with my spanish as well but that's that's probably the one that i'm most proficient with at the moment but as i'm starting to phase in the urdu and arabic languages i'm uh, hoping that they will equalize or ultimately even uh, even take over that mm -hmm. hey the recent spanish videos are great on your channel as well I, I love the where where the wild things are book and rest assured <laughs> it's on the shelf here somewhere behind me Oh, I've read classic. it to my daughter a few few times already. Um, so, guys, if you if you're interested in any of those languages, chat at Mikhail through his channel. Um, Mikhail, is there anything in your background, unrelated to language learning, that you think you are able to parlay into your language learning? Uh, anything in my background un unrelated to language learning? Well, in a sense, because I'm a professional educator i'm a teacher of science and this this has had an interest be, being an educator has had an an interesting relationship with my language learning both mm -hmm. conducive to it but actually in some ways it has really damaged my language learning and held it back as well now the ways that being an educator is conducive to language learning is that i see various uh, Lear learning theories study habits you know i teach how to study how to learn how to revise and so on and i see lots all the time i see lots of successful examples and unsuccessful examples of trying to learn various different types of academic material i think also just being in education i mean, I mean look in life you're always learning things but being in education you are more obviously learning things as well so i think the kind of ethos of being an educationalist and also just having an incredibly busy life which is what teaching in teaching as a british teacher invariably involves i think i think all of that stuff has cultivated my ethic and organization which is naturally not very strong at all when it comes to language learning having said that being an educationalist as well and this is really some this is really something to for any for any viewers who are either in education or you know studying higher level education as well there are actually lots of educational norms which have really held back my language learning because i've approached 
learning languages in a similar way that I would approach something like science, which is what I teach, or mm -hmm. something like mathematics. But in actual fact, the way that one should approach languages is very, very different. There, 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 are some, there are some things in common, for example, such as the concept of spaced repetition. But in short, approaching language learning as if I were approaching science, which is what I have done in the first couple of lessons of my language learning journey, has really helped, has, has actually um, really, really held me back. Mm -hmm. I know we're going to talk about examples of techniques and learning and so on, but one very, very basic one is disregard for the concept of immersion because to learn something like science or maths the idea that you can immerse yourself in stimuli and kind of somehow absorb scientific or mathematical concepts it's it's just ridiculous you can't you mm. know you could surround yourself with quote unquote science you, you wouldn't learn any theory but with languages it's very very different because fundamentally you are learning science and maths but you are acquiring a language with mm -hmm. science and math you are learning lots of specific things with a language you are getting used to it and i now truly believe that is what language learning entails it's acquiring and getting used to more than learning in the classical sense that you would with other subjects mm -hmm. now i had wanted to ask you as a beginner with foreign languages what kind of challenges did you face and overcome so I don't know if that fits the question exactly. I don't know at what stage you were in at that time, but the realization that some of what you have learned as an educator, some of what you're steeped in maybe has to go. Um, but could you tell us something more about the challenges you've faced and how you overcame them? Maybe we can unpack that a little bit more. Yes, I think, I think for a beginner, there are there are so many challenges, but it really doesn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. In fact, most of the challenges that a beginner faces could be completely rubbed out and hundreds of hours of inefficient time could be no longer wasted if they simply watched, well, this interview for a start, but even, <laughs> even, just, a couple of, even just a couple of hours uh, looking through the videos of, of many of the language learning channels. Uh -huh. So there, there are a few things which really make it difficult for anybody who says that they would like to le le learn a language and even assuming that they are sincere i mean a lot of people say oh yeah i'd like to learn a language and then obviously they never they never really put any wholehearted effort into it mm -hmm. but for those who gen you know genuinely do want to learn a language language learning techniques is of course one of these things and then the other one is time management so for language learning techniques, I mean, you know, I'll make it sound like it's something complicated over here. Actually, in my opinion, successful language learning techniques are often a lot more simpler than what is often imagined. Because, of course, what a learner typically does is they replicate what they did in school. Now, chances are what they did in school, at least if it was in the Western education system, did not work. They, they might have achieved the highest grade on an exam. But I mean, when I when I did French, I actually did as a 16 year old achieve a very high grade mm -hmm. but even at that time if you got me to listen to two native speakers talking to each other it would just be noise it, it wouldn't be that I wouldn't exactly be able to keep track no it would just be noise I would not understand it one little bit I would not be able to make my meaning clear unless it was to tell them what was in my pencil case I would not be able to make that my meaning clear in any way shape or form uh -huh. So basically, a beginner is liable to replicate what they did in school. So study grammar, very kind of limited immersion into the language as well. And uh, it, 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 really, it really won't work. What they need to be doing is to be exposing themselves to a huge volume of sounds right from day one. That, that, needs, that needs to be the first thing. And then they need to be uh, acquiring vocabulary acquiring vocabulary in context so reading simple stories for example but spending little or no time on the bespoke grammar in my opinion because what they are doing if they do this is they're basically reading english 
they're basically reading English. But mm -hmm. grammar is not an instruction manual for learning a language. Grammar is just a retrospective description of mm -hmm. what native speakers already know. It, mm -hmm. it shouldn't be considered a recipe. Mm -hmm. So that's the first of two big reasons why beginners fail, because if they don't see if they don't see progress now there is issues to do with impatience and unrealistic expectations as well i, I do get that but mm -hmm. this grammar heavy method will not really see progress and then it is actually understandable that they would that they would give up they'll make a cost benefit analysis mm -hmm. and they'll see that it's not it's not really worth it then the other one is of course time management you know, we all, you know, we all struggle for time. Modern mm -hmm. society is so fast. It really does not respect our time, but there are things that you can do. There, there are things that you can do. You know, one of them, which I always go on about in my channel is using that dead time to be immersed in listening, for example, mm -hmm. then there's swapping the activities that you do in your native language. Like if you watch Netflix or whatever, you know, watch French TV, for example, if, uh, if, if, if French is your language. So, so there's that but then there is also a mindset thing and people need to realize that on the whole no time for something means i've got other priorities yeah and we've got to be honest about that yeah yeah that's wonderful and for those who might be at a little bit of a higher level not not so much beginners with foreign languages what would you say to um keep them progressing along at the intermediate level so that they could hopefully achieve fluency in a reasonable amount of time. I understand that's very hard to define fluency, yeah. but how to continue to make sure they make progress. Yes, I think, I think that, I mean, firstly, I would not claim to be a kind of full, full blown success story with this because even though, even though I would say, with my Spanish, my reading comprehension is fairly strong. Listening comprehension, I can generally, I can generally understand most stuff on a TV program mm -hmm. or the radio, but I do have to concentrate. I do have to concentrate. It's not, it's not just like with English. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if all of that has really translated into speaking and into speaking at that, at, at that same kind of level. But yeah, that kind of intermediate plateau is is a is, is a difficult one to overcome you know once you're once you're kind of conversational once you can kind of chit chat how how to actually overcome that well something that i've found is um my you know there was a point where i thought okay i've reached a decent level here but my vocabulary was nowhere near as good as i thought it was like i had all the vocabulary that one would have when they chat but then when i started to think of words like okay right do i know do i know the spanish word for ignition key you know <laughs> do i know the spanish word for yeah. a jellyfish right you know do i know, do i know the spanish word for you know a hermit crab or something like that so one thing that uh, i found very useful to increase my vocabulary is to read reasonably technical books that are intended for natives so an animal encyclopedia for example mm -hmm. that is for i guess spanish adolescents even adults maybe recipe books would be another one stories audio books so content that is mm -hmm. really just there for natives and that does contain words which any native would know but they won't just come up in random conversations. So you won't learn all these words if you're just talking with a teacher and I talking, for example. Mm. Yet they are still very important words. Yeah. I mean, something which, you know, some language learners propagate this, and, and I really don't agree, this idea that, oh, you can speak a language reasonably well with only a little bit of vocab. I, I, I really don't think that's true at all. You know, even though you can say, okay, 2,000 words is, you know, 90% or 95% of every conversation that's true but it's a five percent of the words that actually give that conversation the specific meaning mm -hmm. you know it's five percent mm -hmm. of the right. words that aren't and but because so right you know what whatever the case may be so i found that to be particularly useful for, voca for vocabulary it's much more fun than learning through flashcards which i sometimes do as well actually mm -hmm. but it's it's quite it's quite fulfilling and then just 
listening to more and more native content at a at a at, at a higher level really so again tv without subtitles the radio as well and i think i i am i do also intend to start having some more lessons as well as opposed to just conversation exchanges just mm-hmm. to you know sharpen it give my learning a bit more gravitas as well mm-hmm. Now let's take it back down to a a lower level because you and I are both fathers. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about your daughter and how you're instilling her with a love and ability for language learning and what kind of resources do you use with her? I remember you pointing out the animal encyclopedia, for example, that's something that I also would love to look at with my daughter is something like that. So tell us a little bit more. So with the, the first thing is that with my daughter, I only speak to her in Spanish at the moment. When, when my Urdu and Arabic get to a conversational level, which I would not say they are at the moment, with, um, with Urdu, I can, it's quite strange. I can understand it if somebody's trying to communicate with me, but not really speak back. But um, once they get to a conversational level, things will get a bit trickier because I'll be trying to talk to her in those languages as well. But um, at this at this point, at this point, I just te- speak to her in Spanish, and it's funny because even though, even though I would not say my Spanish is advanced as such, it really does feel quite strange to her to speak in English, and I I tend not to do that. So even when there's guests, that they probably think, oh, he doesn't really talk to his daughter very much because I'm just saying a couple <laughs> of kind of phrases in English. Though I mean, sometimes I do speak in Spanish, but. Uh-huh. even even in front of guests but it's, it's just an interesting one like if you I suppose the message is if you can speak a language even if you don't feel like it is a particular high level if you are a parent if you speak to the child in that language even if you're making mistakes in that language and so on as I as I as I certainly do mm-hmm. it will seem strange to you to speak to them in English and it does and it actually does so mm-hmm. I speak to her in Spanish but that in itself that, that in itself is not going to be enough for her to acquire the language. In fact, quite often when kids have got one native parent of one language, they still don't grow up with the language because mm. they don't have enough input because most of a child's input is actually not being spoken to, but mm-hmm. rather what they see between both parents. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I know that as the one less than native, to put it mildly, Spanish speaker, that in itself won't be enough. So what I also do is to read her Spanish children's books and, and children's books, by the way, even, you know, this is for any kind of intermediate or lower learners, you know, children's books, even small kids books are actually very good for you as an adult to learn as well. I mean, they contain all sorts of phrases that I'm like, what? Like, I'd, I'd never think of saying that, you know, phrases that I'd never come across from reading, you know, teenage, you know, or, or like, well, older people's books like Harry Potter, for example. Mm-hmm. So, you know, kids, kids I, I, books I, I are very, very useful. Mandarin children's wow. books. Wow, wow, that is a, wow. They look some from amazing. England, some from America, some from Japan, but they all have wow. the, they all have the writing change to the Chinese characters, but they're books from wow. all over the world. Love wow, love it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, children's, children's books are brilliant then to ensure that she gets enough, just general input, getting used to sounds is that I listen to audiobooks all the time. So if I'm feeding her, if I'm playing with her or, or if she's kind of playing, you know, left to her own devices and I'm just around, I will be listening to audiobooks. She will get to listen to those as well. They're not necessarily for kids, but again, she's getting used to the sounds, rhythms, tones. And then when I say something that she's already heard, it's being matched to context. And that's how a language is learned. Mm -hmm. Quick side question. Why are you emphasizing Spanish with her so much? Maybe I missed that somewhere along the way. No, that's a, that's a good question. And it's to be quite honest, it isn't actually anything inherent about Spanish. You know, I actually started studying Spanish almost by accident, really, because a couple of years ago, I was looking to do a French class because I'd studied a bit of French at school. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll kind of learn French again or maybe learn it for the first time, uh, tr- truly in a sense. Um, 
And I, th I think it just wasn't available or something like that at that particular college. So I just enrolled into a Spanish class. And even though, even though it was, you know, the so-called traditional learning, which I'm quite a kind of critic of, you know, very, you know, mm -hmm. delivery, it, it, was, it was a Spaniard, the teacher, but, you know, delivery in, delivery in English, lots of grammar and so on. It, that, that's really, that's really just, just, just what, what, what got the ball rolling. So why, why Spanish? Well, I guess, when she was born, it was the only language that I could kind of chat, chat in. So it was already there. So it's not too much effort. Well, okay, no, I beg your pardon. It is, it is, it is effort, but it's, it's more plausible just to get that to a upper intermediate, lower advanced level. So I can just keep that and I can just maintain that and I can speak to her in that and then think about other, other ventures such as learning my other languages. So, um, quite quite an under quite an underwhelming answer but <laughs> it does also kind of show that you can you know you can kind of fall in love with any language and mm -hmm. you know I didn't have a million reasons to study Spanish when I started doing it it was almost by default by accident mm -hmm. but I do love it I think it would be the same whatever language it was but right you know I do love it yeah that's what you were leading me to think was I think the most important thing here is that you I mean, whichever language it is, is kind of beside the point. You really love it. You've been learning it to a high level. You want to pass it on. And I think to segue into my next question, it's really uh, our daughters are really quite luck lucky because here they have two dads who are into languages, who even have language learning YouTube channels. And hopefully we can really inspire them to grow and, and be interested in many different languages. Um, let's talk about your YouTube channel for a while, your first second language. I love the name of that. And uh, when did you start this channel? What was the impetus behind it? And what's some of your future goals or aspirations with it? So uh, I think I think it was it was last autumn. So it's maybe been it's maybe been going for five or six months or something like that. I think for a while I'd always. I'd always thought maybe this is something I'd like to do at some point. I mean, I'm not a very technologically adept person, but then last lockdown involved using a bit more tech. I mean, I, I, you know, I couldn't even use Zoom. I didn't even know how to use Zoom or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But last, and I know it's like really basic, but last uh, last lockdown I had to use a little bit more technology. And then I started a an online Spanish club wow. just, 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 just for the pupils online. So I thought, well, okay, this seems fairly straightforward. And, um, you know, if I hit record, I've got a video. And then if I've got a video, I can upload it to YouTube. And then, and then of course, I learned that it's a lot harder than you, th you know, it's a lot harder than you think, because lots of people are uploading stuff into YouTube. So it's a diff and, and a lot of those people really know what they're doing in terms of things like editing background music, which, which I, which is a, a still, still, still a bit of a challenge for me, for me really. But I just, I just think it can be, it can be useful for other people to see somebody who is an ordinary person with a very, very busy life, mm -hmm. managing to, with mixed results at times, but managing to learn other languages. Mm -hmm. So, I guess, I guess, I, I guess that's my, I guess that's my motivation really, and I think, I think in future, it's really, really just a case of sharing what is share, sharing what I'm learning and sharing what is working for me. So recently I've shared, I made a video of the language learning methods, which I find I have found to be particularly useful. I've already filmed part two. I'll be uploading that soon because, you know, again, as I said before, the two main obstacles to people who have decided that they'd like to learn a language are the methods because most people's methods suck mm -hmm. and the whole relationship with time. So yeah. I've also recorded a video actually, which I'm really looking to forward to posting, which is basically some home truths about why people don't have time. And I will go pretty brutal into this as well. You know, things like does your society, your surroundings, your friends, even your partners and spouses, even even actually care about your self-improvement goals. Mm -hmm. You know, when people also when people say they don't have time or have to, I have time after this event happens. Are they just taking an ideological stance? I'm in this position where I don't have enough time. Mm -hmm. um, so 
so so so so those sorts those sorts of things really how i manage to how how i manage my relationship with time other commitments and Mm -hmm. what language learning techniques work so guys look forward to those videos for sure i'm also big super big on the mindset and the time management aspects um the environmental aspects how about the videos that you've already put out in the past where would you recommend well, which videos would you recommend someone new to your channel watch first? So, um, well, there are a few that I wouldn't recommend, especially, <laughs> okay. especially, especially, especially my early ones. I mean, I still think some of the messages I get across, uh, mm-hmm. I, I get across are still important messages, but, um, but yeah, the, um, objective video quality of some of them isn't brilliant, but, um, a few that I would recommend there's a video which is 10 attitudes which are killing your language learning i think that 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 was one of the more well received ones i think that 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 could be a very useful one there is there's a videos which i've alluded to which i will be posting which at the time of this video might already be out there's a video i have made which is basically a presentation of eight of my preferred language learning methods where the pros and cons you know, relative pros and cons of them are listed. I think, I think those, I think those two videos between them would would just be very useful for for for, for, for anybody really. And and apart from that, it's um it's other things that you like. So you know, are you somebody who is interested in the concept of learning styles? You know, do we have discrete learning styles? I've made I've made a video about that. I've made a couple more videos about attitudes, like five attitudes, which which really would benefit your language learning, which people don't really think about. Mm-hmm. I've made a couple of videos of language learning methods, which I think are sometimes a little bit overrated. So there's, there's lots of stuff. There's, there's lots of uh, diverse, diverse material. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. And I will definitely put links to those videos uh, in the description and maybe some cards into this video. So you guys can go directly to it. Um, Besides the YouTube channel, are, is there any other ways that you'd like to connect with people online? Is there any other place you would like to share for them to meet up with you or connect with you? Uh, at this, at this, at this current moment, at this current moment, it's it really it really is just my channel. I mean, I have I have a I have a fairly a fairly inactive Facebook account. I have a LinkedIn account as well, which I do I do I do intend to. Right. By the time you watch this video, I will have I will have given links to my LinkedIn account. So I've got I've got those as well. But um, as I'm not I'm not really a huge I'm not really a huge social media person. I, I can often be quite scathing about our over dependence and reliance of social media. And and I like I like I like to be consistent. You know, I'm even consistent with this with because YouTube is social media as well. There are even some times where I'll say in my videos, look, I know I criticize social media. I know this is social media. I'd just listen to this video and do the dishes or something like that. You don't have to look, you don't have to like look at me or anything like that. <laughs> and after this video, get off social media. And if you don't watch this video and you get off social media, I'm still happy, especially if it's to learn languages. So in short, it's mostly, it's mostly just my YouTube channel. Great. Great. Okay. Uh, they'll be able to find that for sure through this vid. So I wanted to dip our toes into a little bit of philosophy with you. You stated on your channel that language learning is a reflection of the divine reality and a part of your spiritual journey. And I'm very intrigued by that. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that means? Yeah. So um, I am, I, I like, I like to think that I'm, I'm quite a, I'm quite a philosophical person, I guess. And, um, and I know, by the way, I know some people say that and it just sounds really pretentious, but what, what I mean, what I mean by that is, is not that, um, I have, uh, not, not that I have some, um, a multitude of insights, which other people don't have, but I just mean that I like to, I like to reflect and think about things. So, um, both, uh, both philosophy and, uh, and religion are both, are both things that I am very important, uh, very, um, very interested in, in both in both an intellectual and historical level, but also a, a personal and spiritual one as well. And uh, well, as a, as a matter of fact, I won't digress too much, but I do, I do actually have another, another fledgling channel as well. It's, it's about something completely different. It's really about um, 
navigating navigating through the 21st century as somebody who maintains a a religious and philosophical uh, worldview so i do have another channel i've only got a couple of videos on that on that one so far um but anyway yeah so i think that almost almost out of consistency really if you do have a religious or spiritual kind of worldview which which i do it's it's in it's it's inconsistent if that doesn't inform what you do in life whether that is you know how i interact with my neighbors how i choose my profession how i interact with my colleagues and how i pass my you know free free, free time if you like uh, so to speak though i know as fathers we don't we don't have an abundance of time of time that is truly free so yeah i mean languages are you know well as as, as i described a just studying languages i think is just one of many ways which i feel more connected to you know whatever whatever word you you prefer you know the kind of more neutral divine reality god the us mm -hmm. you know whatever uh, whatever whatever t allah whatever whatever term you 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 use and um i mean there's a there's there's a verse uh, from the uh, quran which i kind of particularly resonate with which is saying how the multitude of languages are well are literally signs of the divine reality so i've mm -hmm. you know more or less kind of taken take take taken that quote really Mm. But then, then I guess on a practical level, I suppose, you know, as we both know, you know, especially as somebody who studies a language like Mandarin, as, as you do, which is so far removed from English, is that languages are different systems of communication. Mm -hmm. they, they are completely different. One language cannot be truly translated into another. So I feel that by learning other languages, I am learning different well, just learning entirely different forms of, of communication. And, um, you know, when I consider text like the primary text of my faith, which is the uh, Quran, but then other texts as well, which, um, and by the way, as a kind of little, little bit of theology, the, which a lot of people might not realize the, um, the Islamic faith actually does, does recognize that other other religious texts have have genuine validity and connection to the to 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 the divine so i think learning languages is another way i mean learning arabic for example is another way sorry there's an airplane up there i don't know how loudly you can hear it but is actually just a way of con connecting to my own faith as well really mm -hmm. because a language like arabic is so removed from a language like English that, mm -hmm. you know, reading a, you know, sacred scripture in English and then its original language, however well you can quote unquote translate it, it will just be a completely, completely different experience. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I guess I feel philosophically and spiritually incomplete only being able to communicate or understand one language. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. And it, you know, it really resonates with me, as you said, because I, I learned Mandarin and, and one of the reasons why I got into Mandarin and came to China was through the doorway of Eastern religion and Eastern philosophies. I have a scroll of the Tao Te Ching right there, Lao Tzu's famous book. It's like a calligraphy scroll that you can practice with. And I feel like when I study Chinese poetry or philosophy, those texts, when I'm studying that, it really activates the spirit, you know, it activates something deeper within you and gets, gets that moving. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, without, with, without a doubt. And, you know, this is, you know, this, th th this is something that, that is, really really kind of lacking in in the western in, in the mm. western world really in, in in my opinion i mean you know some there is this kind of vague you know so there's some people who kind of say in a very kind of vague way are like you know i feel i feel kind of spiritual but it's it's very detached from you know language or richness or or, or tradition or 
or, or, or anything like that. Whereas in the eastern part of the world, you know, in the eastern part of the world, that 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 I suppose is it's it's still it's still there really. I mean, in in different ways, but yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, this, I mean, this will be a great topic for a whole nother interview. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. You, go yeah much absolutely. you can have me on that other fledgling channel. and we'll... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, um, ab- absolutely. Cause I think on a, on a, again, you know, language channel won't, won't digress too much, but on a, on, on a kind of brief theological note, really, there's a, you know, there's a perception in the West that, you know, kind of, you know, East, Eastern philosophy, which you've mentioned is, um, you know, is, is, you know, kind of very rich and sophisticated, which I agree with, which I agree with it is. But then the, you know, the so-called, there's also a perception that the so-called traditional religions are, are devoid of that kind of philosophical richness. Now, a lot of that, a lot of that I do actually just blame on the practitioners of those, of, of those religions, whether it's mine, whether it's Christianity, whether it's Judaism, but, um, but, but but in actual fact, there is lots of, you know, in all three religions, uh, there is there is lots of spiritual and philosophical uh, richness, which has some not complete, which which definitely has some overlap with the mm-hmm. kind of Eastern Eastern traditions as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it's great that we'll both be able to inspire our daughters, not only well, we can inspire them through you know, spiritually through their language learning as well. And philosophy and religion is so important to sort of orient us at any time, but especially now, as you mentioned in the 21st century. So hopefully we can chat more about that in the future. Um, Guys, he does it all. Mikhail, thank you so much for coming on the philosophy and the tactics. Uh, Before you go, any parting advice for language learners uh, what would be your biggest tip or something that you really want them to take away from our time together? I think my biggest tip would really be to say that you need to integrate the language into your life. I've, I've often, you know, kind of thought, thought over the question, how, how much should language learning dominate your life? And, uh, you know, quite often from even very high profile language learners, they'll say, you know, language learning need not dominate your life. It, you know, you can only do it with, you know, half an arbitrary number, like half an hour a day. And, mm. and I get it because they're trying to encourage people to, you know, to learn, to learn new languages. So they're trying to say it's not, it's, it's, it's not too difficult. And it isn't too difficult in the sense that anybody can do it, regardless of, you know, so-called talent or academic predisposition. But I have actually come to realize that in some sense, learning a language well actually should dominate your life. Now, what I, what I don't mean by this is that you need to put all your activities aside and just do bespoke language learning study. I don't think that's the case at all. I think somebody can learn a language extremely well with only maybe 30 minutes bespoke, bespoke study every day. But as well as that, the language really, really needs to be integrated into their life in a holistic way, right? Yeah. You know, almost almost think of it as, look, right, if you're going to be learning Russian, you need to teach yourself how to become a Russian, right? Yeah. Yeah. You're not just learning how Russian grammar works. You're teaching yourself how to become a Russian. You need to listen to Russian. Well, if you listen to music, you need to listen to Russian music, Russian radio, Russian TV, Mm-hmm. You need to be saying little Russian catchphrases or exclamations or even expletives every time you stub your toe. If you do that, you know, if you do that in English. So integrate, integrate the language into your life. And if you do that, ultimately you, ultimately you cannot fail because you will hear the sounds, you will recognize the sounds, mm-hmm. you will match those sounds with context and you will succeed. It's not a case of some people can do it, some people can't based on talent or age or anything like that. It's a case of how much input you get, how integrated is the language into your life. Mm-hmm. Also, you do have time. You really do have time. If you're, saying you don't, if you're saying that you don't have time, you are probably taking an ideological position where you've got all the priorities. Stop kidding yourself. Get off YouTube. 
watch the videos in Matt's channel. Though. Watch, watch the videos <laughs> in Matthew's channel. But apart from that, <laughs> get off YouTube, listen all the time. Okay, guys, you heard it from the man himself, Mikhail. I couldn't put it better than that. I'm going to let him have the last word. Scurry on over now to his channel. Check it out. Your first second language. Links in the video below. Mikhail, thank you so much for coming on. Bro, thank you. It's a pleasure as always. Bye for now. Take care.